aspiring actuaries, welcome to a Q&A with me. If you're watching this on replay and are not here live with me, um, do feel free to leave some comments in the comments below. I do try to reply to everyone's questions, so feel free to ask me something and I will reply later. Also, I will try to come up with some sort of a pinned comment below that puts time codes for all the different questions that I'm going to be answering over the course of this live stream because I do anticipate it'll be a little waffly. I anticipate it'll be a little bit um, out of order just based off of whoever asks whatever questions. So without further ado, as we wait for people to show up, I'll just take a couple seconds to introduce myself. Hi, my name is Michelle. I am a fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society, a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries. Uh, I am a working actuary. I work as a pricing actuary, pricing car and home insurance for a major property and casualty insurer in Canada. So that's me. That's what I do. Um, let's see if there are any questions already. Uh, we have a question saying, is actuarial job a desk job from start as intern to the end? So that really depends. Uh, for me, I definitely have a desk job. As you are well aware, I mean, if you're watching this live, you're well aware if you're watching this in 17 years, maybe not. But as you're well aware right now, the world is kind of shut down and I am actually working from home. So welcome to my home office. Let me show you my desk right now. This is where I work. This is my whole life. I barely leave my apartment, but yes, I definitely have a desk job as an actuary these days. And from start to finish, I have been working at a desk. Um, there are different types of paths that actuaries can take. Um, so if you work for a consulting company, as an example, your goal is to really become an actuarial consultant. Your goal is to meet with clients and deal with people and so in that kind of an environment maybe you won't be so much at a desk towards the end of your career but i work for an insurance company and i can say that you know my boss works at a desk his boss works at a desk his boss works at a desk yes i have a lot of men managing me at the moment but um i think the difference between my job and their job is I don't have to go to as many meetings and meetings are my least favorite thing in the world. Well, not that's not true. A good quality meeting is very helpful. My biggest pet peeve is meetings with way too many people and like, you know, let's just invite everyone and not have an agenda. And then no one's really paying any attention because no one really has to be there. And so that's just, ugh, it's such a waste of my time. Ugh, I can't deal with that. All right, let's see. Oh man, I missed a whole lot of questions. Okay, um, I want to leave healthcare. Should I get my master's in actuarial science? I have a bachelor of science in healthcare science. Um, if you want to get a master's in actuarial science, go for it. If you want, you can just start writing actuarial exams. You don't really need a degree in actuarial anything to take the actuarial exams and to work as an actuary. You do need some sort of a university degree to be an actuary, but it doesn't have to be in actuarial science. Like, I think it's a relatively new thing in the US and in some parts of the world to even have actuarial programs in their universities. Really, um, here in Canada, it's been around for a while. And so I'd say a good majority of the people that I work with do have a bachelor's in actuarial science. Very few of my coworkers have masters. But I mean, if you wanna do it, Go for it. Go back to university. Live your best life. Um, what, courses, what courses would you advise someone to take as first year courses? So I went to university in Quebec, which is the school system is a little bit different. So there you go for high school until grade 11. And then you have two years of what's called SAGEP and then three years of university. Whereas I know that in a lot of other places, high school goes to grade 12 and then you have four years of university. So it still works out to be 16 years. It's just split out differently. So my first year of university would be the equivalent of like a second year in university. But what I definitely would recommend regardless, I just don't, my, I, I context this by saying, I don't exactly know what you already learned in high school before going into university, but things that in 
new to university person should probably know are calculus, for sure. You need to understand uh, how to do derivatives and integrals, not for the work. Lord knows I have never done an integral at the office in my life, but to be able to pass actuarial exams, you do need to understand integrals and derivatives and just calculus stuff. Um, your basic statistics courses, so something in probability, something in statistics for sure, absolutely. Um, and I don't know, I would say at the beginning, I mean, you're going to have to take some sort of a macroeconomics, microeconomics course. Um, if you can take other math courses, that could be fun. But also, I really encourage you to take random courses throughout your university degree. Like my favorite course in university was probably towards the end when I was just getting fed up with math classes and I decided to take a creative writing class. I just found that so fun. So like, don't don't think that everything you learn in university has to be career focused, career focused. Like let yourself have some fun, do something creative, take a pottery class, like you do you, YOLO. Um, what's your favorite and least favorite part of the job? Um, I would say I have a lot of things that I love and a lot of things that I don't love. So let's start with the things that I love. I love my coworkers. Number one, best thing ever. I love them. They're not watching this. They're definitely not watching this. But if they're watching this, I love you. Um, I love that I have to think creatively when I work. I have to think, how do I manipulate the data? What is this data trying to tell me? How do I turn what I see, just a big page full of numbers, turn that into a story that I can then manipulate into, okay, this is what we're seeing in the trends. This is what we're seeing in our book of business. This is what we're seeing in the industry. Let's take these different pieces, make the links with each other, and then translate that into how do we change our prices so that A, we're charging the best prices to our customers. B, um, we're being fair to our customers. C, we are um, helping our company be more profitable. I, if I said that my job was not optimizing profits and making and making sure that the company stayed profitable, uh, I would be lying because profit is a huge element of actuarial pricing. And yeah, so just being able to take what I see, create a story, come up with an action plan, and then put that action in place that directly impacts customers. Like I can see from start to finish every element of how I'm really impacting insurance customers. And I think that's so cool. Uh, things I don't necessarily love about my job are sometimes I'm just fed up with the fact that I work at a big company. Some days I love working for a big company. Some days I'm like, yes, I'm just a small cog in a big chain. And if I'm just having an off day, it's like the company will still work. Everything will be fine. If I, if I'm late for work one day, like it's fine. It's not the end of the world. And some days like the bureaucracy of it drives me crazy when you're looking for an answer. And so you're like, I don't know who to ask. And so you have to go, you ask this person, they ask that person because no one in the company knows who knows the information. Like that just drives me mental. I already said it earlier in the live stream, but also um, meetings with too many people drive me absolutely bananas. And thankfully I really don't have too many of those. I make an, a point of just not accepting those invitations because I feel like my time is very valuable. And so I don't, like to waste it in meetings that don't bring a ton of value in some way. Um, but yeah, I would say the bureaucracy of working for a large company kind of gets me annoyed sometimes, but I love it most of the days. Um, I love your videos. Thank you. And it really does help us. I wanted to ask, I failed the first exam, which I thought, which I took through IFOA. Should I keep trying and how to get better at my next exam? Absolutely 100% try again. So I don't know the stats on the IFOA, but here in North America, exams have about a 40% pass rate. And that includes people who are taking the exam for the second, first, uh, second third time. Um, the, the exams are not designed to have everyone pass on the first try. And I think that the material that you learn in the actual exams is definitely important, but there's definitely a secondary goal of making sure that the people who can pass actuarial exams are also the kind of people who are resilient to change, who can fail an exam and still say, you know what, I'm going to try again, I'm going to keep going. 
um, to make sure that these are the kinds of people who are quick learners, who are going to um, keep trying, who are going to teach themselves the different material, can learn it from a book because you're not being taught everything in school. From videos, there are a ton of really helpful resources online, um, like for to pay for. You you have to pay for your study manuals, but there's you still have to learn it yourself. You have to take the initiative to do it outside of your university education, and all of that resilience training is really helpful in your actuarial work. So, for somewhat no. I would lie if I say I didn't want to quit my actuarial exams a million times because I did. But if you were to quit after failing your first exam, I would say that shows that this is not for you. And that's fine. Like it's there are a lot of other careers that might be perfectly suited for you. You might make the best insert other career here. So it's not a failure to not be able to be an actuary or to not want to be an actuary. I'm just saying that if one exam failure is not is is going to kill your actuarial dreams, then maybe it's not for you. Um, can one be a freelancer actuary? I think people do, but I personally haven't done it. So I don't know. I've only ever worked for um, this large insurance company that I work for. You know, we have over, you know, large being more than 10,000 employees. So big insurance company. Do you think actuarial jobs would shrink due to this pandemic? I don't, I don't have an answer for that. I don't think so. I think that right now I'm still being contacted by recruiters. I've had a coworker um, leave the company a week ago at this point and go to a different company. So like companies right now are still hiring actuaries. Um, this week we actually, the, the new interns at my company just started and on my team we have two interns. So it's very weird right now. We are remotely onboarding our interns. I have to teach them everything, you know, from the comfort of my home with phone calls and video chats and Skype messages. And so I think the nature of the work and how we interact as employees is changing. Whether or not the overall job market is going to shrink I don't have an answer for you. I, I wish I could. Um, I see that I already have 24 thumbs up. I appreciate it so much. Honestly, you guys, I am so ego driven and like, I am definitely the kind of person who every time I post a video, I just refresh, refresh, refresh to see how many thumbs up I get. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, it just dropped a 30. You guys are the best. I love you. And uh, you're like the positive reinforcement that I get really, um, is the reason why I continue to make these videos. I will admit I got kind of sad in my last video because I, 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 I had forgotten to say at the beginning of the video to thumbs up. And then usually my videos will get about a 10%, uh, like over 10% view to thumbs up ratio in the first few days. And then eventually it peters off because it stops being subscribers who watch my videos. But I forgot to mention it and so it was like well below 5% to viewers who thumbs it up and I'm like, why is this video a failure? So yeah, I'm very ego driven, very, very sad. So I've, I just appreciate it. And I'm so grateful that you guys take the time to just give me a little bit of positive reinforcement, especially since I'm living alone, I'm quarantining alone and um, you guys can be my friends. Okay, um, let's see. Can you guide or tell something about CS1 exam? That is definitely not a North American exam, so I have no idea what the curriculum is for that one. I'm sorry. Um, is it is it hard to freelance for a non-life job? I've never tried, so I don't really know how hard or easy it is. How was your social life while studying to become an actuary? So my first semester of university was probably my most most social semester. I had a group of really good friends and then at the end of the semester, so in December around Christmas time, we all, it was a group of 13 of us, we decided to go to um, Cuba together. I just, a blast. It was so social, so much fun. I really loved it. And uh, my second semester I started, well two things changed. One, I started dating someone and two, I uh, started studying for actuarial exams. And I would say that I became the kind of person who just spent 
all my time with my boyfriend instead of my friends. So that really hurt my social life, but more so because you're not really worried about, you know, my boyfriend situation. Uh, <laughs> I, I imagine that's not what you're asking. Is um, I I did spend to a lot of time. You know, you choose not to go to a party because you have to study for exams, and so your actuarial exam your sorry your actuarial friends will understand that. I'm skipping a party today because of an exam in three months, but your non-actuarial friends might be a little bit annoyed. Um, that being said, I'm still very close with my high school friends. So, you know, five years of studying for actuarial exams not kill our friendship and I love them and they're amazing. Next question. Why did you choose pricing as opposed to reserving or capital modeling? Good question. So I work for a very large insurance company. And because of that, we have a lot of actuaries, like north of 300 actuaries across Canada and the US. Um, because of this, it, we have a different dynamic to a company that is a small company. So if you have a company where they have four actuaries, you know, everyone's going to work on everything. Everyone's going to do both pricing, reserving, like overlap, it's all it's all the same my company is very big and so we segment so we've got like teams of pricing actuaries and then even within that you know we split it between personal lines and commercial lines we split it between broker business and direct business we split it between provinces so like very niche teams and then what we do is we have what's called a rotation program so every three-ish years actuaries will switch teams to get exposure to uh, different departments and different parts of actuarial work. And what you do is you get to A, learn by working with different types of people and learning with different skill sets. Two, you get to bring the knowledge that you learned in your initial team to your new team. Three, you get to learn the information from your new team. So right now I call myself a pricing actuary, I do. But in a year from now, I might say, hi, I'm an, a reserving actuary because I will switch from my team to reserving or I might switch from my team to uh, more predictive modeling or I might switch from my team to something outside of actuarial. Um, my company is very encouraging of actuaries going to places like claims, which I already did, or marketing or audit or wherever just to get to see a different side of the business and get a different perspective. Bring the actuarial wisdom outside of actuarial and um, also learn about different sides of insurance. So uh, how did I choose pricing? I mean, I just ended up like, I mean, it, it was appealing to me, but it's also where I ended up in my rotation. And then it does not limit me to, to never, or it doesn't mean I'll never be a reserving actuary, or it doesn't mean I'll never work in reserving. Uh, oh, don't put your finger there, you'll cover the camera. What do I have to look for if I want to set up a consulting firm? Not a clue. I am not, I have never done that. I'm first year actuary student. What would you suggest the best time to attend society papers and how many? I don't know about the timing outside of North America, I'm sorry. What is the difference between FSA, fellow of the Society of Actuaries, who pursued general insurance track during his or her fellowship versus FCAS? This is a good question. So before the difference between the SOA and the CAS, they were mutually exclusive. So FSA did like life, health, pensions, investments, and the CAS did um, non-life non general insurance, so like property casualty insurance. Um, the SOA then came up with a general insurance track which sort of pretty much overlaps the CAS. Um, I am a fellow of the CAS, the CAS, so I went with that route. Um, right now, what I would say is the re in Canada, there aren't many people going with the general insurance track because it's not regulate, not recognized. The, at the time, I'm saying this unless something changed very recently that I didn't become aware of. Um, the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, which is the institute that regulates actuaries in Canada, does not recognize the general insurance track of the SOA. So you cannot be assigning actuary in general insurance in Canada if you do 
the general insurance track in the SOA. That being said, is there something wrong with it? Probably not. Have I compared the curriculum and like d done both paths? I have not. I imagine that in 10 years time, assuming people actually start doing the general insurance track, they'll be equivalent. Um, what I love about the CAS, the CAS, the Casualty Actuarial Society, is that it's 100% focused on stuff that is relevant to me. They, I'm going to webinars at least once or twice a month on topics on general insurance, whereas the Society of Actuaries is not arranging that for you. The Society of Actuaries is not coming up with consistent general insurance, uh, like continuing education content. It's not putting on, you know, six conferences a year for general insurance, whereas the CAS puts on uh, a rate making conference, a reserving conference, a reinsurance conference, the spring conference, the annual conference, there's an in focus and like just a zillion webinars. So personally, I love that community element of the CAS, but I'm not going to put down the SOA at all. If that's what you want to do for sure. Absolutely. Like I think at some point it's going to be equivalent, but I couldn't tell you when. Um, on average, how much time did you take to study before each exam? How much time off did your company give per exam? So for preliminary exams, I'd study for about three months. And for advanced exams, I'd study for about four months, which it seems like my coworkers these days are doing less than that. Like my coworkers seem to be doing three months for advanced exams, which seems tight to me, but okay. Personally, I can't study for very much at the beginning. So I do, a, I'd rather do a little bit of studying a day for a longer period of time rather than try to cram everything in a shorter amount of time. And so that's why I studied for four months for the advanced exams. Um, my company gave, so I, I was doing advanced exams when I started full time, but I think for preliminary exams, they give eight study days plus the day of the exam. And for advanced exams, it's definitely 15 plus the day of the exam. And then, um, the way that it works is if you fail the exam, my company, the, the second time it goes from 15 to 12 and then eight and then four like study days. So each time you're, you get fewer and fewer study days to restudy for the exam, but you could always obviously take uh, vacation days or unpaid days. If you feel like uh, study days is not enough. Um, which would be advantageous if I start the career pricing or reserving? Honestly, like both are really interesting. It just depends on what you like to do and where you end up and where you get an opportunity. I love pricing because I can see the direct impact on the customer. I love pricing because it's very um, creative in that, you know, you're trying to come up with the best ways to segment your book of business. You know, like if we find out that someone's favorite type of cheese is predictive of how likely they are to have an accident, then like, how do I incorporate that into the algorithm? You know, charge more for people who like Swiss, charge less for people who like Brie, you know, like it's creative and it's fun and I, I enjoy that. Um, reserving is much more of a um, cyclical type work from what I can tell. You know, they have to do month end reviews, quarter end reviews. So it's much more like accountants where it's, you know, they're doing periodic reviews. There's a ton of creativity um, and reserving actuaries would be people who have to have a really good understanding of what's going on in the insurance company. Like they've got to be on the top of their game. If I need to know what's going on, like that's the team I'm going to go ask first because they have to be sharp and on it. Um, whereas I'm focused on my tiny little segment of like personal lines, Ontario pricing. I don't know what's happening everywhere. So um, both are good. Both are fun. I would imagine it's just a different type of work. Um, would I do my CFA? I've never really been tempted, but I'm not going to discourage anyone from doing it. Would it have been bad if the CAS and SOA merged? The number of votes required wasn't met. Just wondering why. I, so if you don't have the context for this, the Society of Actuaries and the Casualty Actuarial Society, when was this, a year ago at this point? Definitely within the last two years, um, we're considering merging and becoming one like joint society. And I think 
like I wasn't against it, but I wasn't hugely in favor of it. Um, a lot because of the reasons that I had mentioned previously in that the CAS is such a nice community of only general insurance actuaries. And they're just, every time I go to a CAS event, it's so nice and the people are so nice and we all have the same general field. And so our conferences are specialized and I don't know. I think we might've lost a little bit of that community element, but I wasn't against it. So yeah, is what it is. Is it hard for a foreigner to get a job in Canada? I've personally never been a been foreigner trying to get a job in Canada. I do have several coworkers who come from abroad, be it Pakistan or uh, Ireland, or um, we got someone from Sri Lanka. I'm just like going through the list. We have. We have people from all over. Now, I don't know if there are, you know, 5,000 people who applied and only three who got it. Like, there are more than three people who are not from Canada at my company. But um, I don't I don't know what the odds are, but I do know that there are people from outside Canada who have jobs at my company. So, I, it's not impossible. Um, how's the salary? I get paid more than I need. <laughs> Way more than I need. I can very comfortably afford my apartment in Toronto and I now I live alone. I have no mortgage, I have no car, I have no kids, I have no dependents, I have no debt. I have more disposable income than I know what to do with. Uh, so I do invest in ETFs, I do donate to charity, I do save a lot of it. And sometimes I do dumb things like buy a lot of pajamas because I'm home all day and I will be honest, working from home, HR says, you know, don't work in your pajamas. You guys, I go from last night's pajamas to tonight's pajamas. Occasionally, if I'm doing yoga that day, I will change from last night's pajamas to my yoga clothes to tonight's pajamas. But like I'm in pajamas all day. I promise you that right now I put on a shirt just for you guys, but we got pajamas on the bottom <laughs> so sometimes i splurge on things but in general um i'm not complaining about my salary ever um do you think the exams are more to be a barrier for entry since they're so math heavy and you probably don't use this math at work yeah i think there's definitely an element of that for sure i think i think there's huge value in again, I was talking about this, the resilience and the ability for someone to pass this exam shows that they are a quick learner and are hot and they are good at problem solving. And so it shows a lot of skills, but there is definitely an element of this is a barrier for entry for sure. hundred uh, percent. Would any fairly complete prob book do? I can't promise that any probability book would be sufficient to pass an exam. I, I wouldn't want to give you that advice. Hello from Mexico City. Hello from Toronto. Do you think it's possible to get work in your country with a degree in university abroad and some exams from the SOA? For sure. You don't need a degree from here. Who says degrees from here are good? Honestly, I was having this thought today. It's like, if all universities start becoming online universities and all jobs seem to be work from home jobs, then like, I could be working in any city. Like I could take a job in Vancouver, but still work from Toronto. I can go work out in the suburbs. I personally, you know, I value having a short commute. I, in a, in a world where my office is not in my apartment, my walk to work is 20 minutes. And like, that is the best thing about my job. Like I love my tiny commute. And so um, I, I really was never, happy about the idea of moving to the suburbs and having to commute an hour two hours to work that's a ton but now that everyone's working from home if the world becomes a place where we're just working from home like i could go live further out in the suburbs get a bigger house and not be right downtown but still not have a giant commute so the world's changing what was the question i don't even remember i forget um 
Hope you're doing well. I am doing well. Thank you. If you want updates on my life, you can go to my Instagram page. I don't recommend it because it's just full of madness. And mostly, these days, it's mostly just pictures of my stomach. Because I really, I'm approaching 30. I'm 28 now. And I really just want to remember how good I look at age, it, it, not age 20, but just like in my 20s. I'm wearing no makeup right now. I look great, like go me. And so right now, honestly, I've been posting just way too many pictures and my my likes on my pictures have been going down because people don't care, but it brings me joy to, to document my madness. I'm probably going mental, it's fine. What other careers did you consider and why did you choose to become an actuary? Uh, basically, I was considering either becoming an actuary or becoming an engineer. And ultimately, it just boiled down to, A, um, engineering, you have to do a lot of labs. And I didn't want to do a lot of labs, too. My dad's an engineer, and I just didn't want to, I didn't want to do, like, what my dad did. I wanted to do my own thing. So I went into becoming an actuary, and most days I like it. Some days I just want to, like, hide and quit or stay in bed all day. But that's not because of being an actuary, that's because I'm a quitter. That's because I'm a lazy person. Like, if I could just spend the rest of my life not worrying about a job and instead, like, chilling whenever, traveling whenever, like, that'd be good. But that's not reality. So I do love my job. It's just some days I want to not do my job and watch Netflix all day, which is normal. Um, what's your favorite book, most useful book you read? I will admit... I'm not a very big reader, and this is not something, this is not a point of pride at all. Um, I did, I, I like reading self-help, but I have a bad habit of reading like a third of it, a half of it, and then not finishing it. Um, but books that I enjoyed, I enjoyed How to Win Friends and Influence People. I don't think I finished it, but I enjoyed the bits that I read. Um, I enjoyed Lean In, uh, that was a good one. Um, currently I'm listening to an audiobook. It's not self-help, it's not helpful, but it's it's interesting. It's called uh, The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. It's a fiction. It's a mystery. I'm enjoying it. I'm not listening to it too regularly, but 